Welcome to another Saturday night and taking it to the nub. Like I've been saying all week, we have a special show tonight. I've got a filmmaker, investor, advisor, a cigar aficionado that you might know the brand of years ago he was part of. We'll get into that. And an inspirator to trailblazers who seek to disrupt. And that man is Marvin Samuel. Now, just before we get into bringing him on, we'll throw out some advertising here because we got to pay for this show somehow. And let us start our little advertising. And today's show is brought to you by of Taking It to the Nub is sponsored by the Box Press Cigar app, the ultimate cigar smoking experience. With Box Press, you can easily catalog cigars with your own virtual humidor, quickly rate and record notes for any cigar using the Smoke Session feature, receive intelligent cigar recommendations based on your personal taste profile, and access exclusive discounts from top cigar brands. You can even shop your favorite cigars directly in the app, then automatically sync the order to your virtual humidor, plus so much more. Download Box Press today by typing bxpr.sd slash install into any web browser and discover the world of cigars like never before. That's bxpr.sd slash install. And today's show is brought to you by All Saints Cigars. A company founded in 2019 and headed up by industry veteran Mickey Pegg and his two friends, Martin Corboy, a successful restaurateur, and Frank Leo, an Air Force Academy graduate military veteran. As Mickey explains it, they were all sitting down talking and smoking cigars, and finally they decided that they would do this thing together. It was time. Mickey said, I decided if I'm going to work hard at it, it should be something I love. Besides, a tough day with a cigar is better than a great day doing anything else. Soon after, they began the process of launching All Saints Cigars, jokingly referring to themselves as the Holy Trinity, St. Michael, St. Martin, and St. Francis. They chose for their logo the Cross of St. James, the patron saint of Nicaragua, the country where their cigars would be produced. You can check out All Saints Cigars at www.allsaintscigars.com. Okay, let us bring in Marvin, my very special guest. Marvin, how are you? Thank you for joining, taking it to the nub. Cigar Jimmy, it's great to be here, bro. <laughs> Missing your Yankee hat on, I figure we could have a little spat back and forth. But yeah, I didn't. I left the Yankee home, the Yankee hat back at home. I'm here in Vegas on business, and uh, I'm feeling a little bit pissed off looking at that big fucking B on your hat on your head over there, Jim. How about I? How about I go with the A? The A. That's the a, okay. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> hey, you should be happy, actually. Believe it or not, you know. Because we just beat up on the Rays in game one of a doubleheader, which gave you that, room yeah. to move up. Come on, come on. You're ahead of us. So we beat the Rays. It helps you. So you should be rooting for the Red Sox this series. Well, I know it's just, hard. They're just getting underway in L.A. Yeah. They got, got walloped last night. But uh, hopefully tonight they come back. All right. Well, we, got, <laughs> we still got plenty more season to play. You know how these things go. The Rays eventually have to get into a slump. Let's hope they do for the best of all of us. But great team. Can't take it away from them. I'll tell you a quick, quick story. I went, I've been to one game at Fenway. Hmm. So my boy Dave Lafferty and I go to a – so Dave was my you – know, one of my top guys at Drew State. And uh, we go to – uh, we go to see the Red Sox were playing, I think the Blue Jays or something. And uh, I put my Yankee hat on as we're, we're in the parking lot. I opened the back. I opened my luggage. I put my hat on. And he's like, what are you doing? I go, what do you mean? He goes, no, 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 no. You're not putting your Yankee hat on. He, and by the way, we're in the bleachers. Oh, wrong place to do that. Okay. <laughs> 
we get into probably the biggest argument I've known Dave since 2007, so 16 years now. I would say that was the biggest argument. He literally said, I'm not going in. So I said, all right, how about I take and I put it like I, I folded it, I, I put it in my pocket. So we go into the stadium, game's on, and like by the third inning, all I'm hearing is, Yankees suck, Yankees suck. And I'm like, what the hell's going on? They, they, they were They're not even playing the Blue Jays. <laughs> like, like the Yankees were playing the A's or something on a West Coast trip. <laughs> and, and finally, I'm like, I had enough of this shit. I put my Yankee hat on. And in the sixth inning, I got doused. Somebody took, a, took like a cup of beer and from two, three rows back, threw it at me. I'm doused. And now Dave looks at me and goes, you see, what did I tell you? What did I tell you? <laughs> not that I wasn't, I was, I held my ground, bro. I'm not going to not represent, but they were all right. You know, they gave me a lot of shit, but they were all right. And somebody threw a beer at me. But that's, you know, you had to expect that, you know. I took it like a man, man. That's good. <laughs> <laughs> I'll tell you a story sometime later. I had a similar story before I became a Red Sox fan because I was a Yankee fan yeah. at one time. And yeah, I did I something very similar. You're a complete traitor. But that's ah, I, okay, we'll just leave it at that. <laughs> um talk traders you left the cigar industry what can i say you know <laughs> i got paid though i didn't just you leave. got paid all right <laughs> let's get into that for a second um okay. so today's show is as much as we love talking about cigars and bourbon i don't know if you're drinking anything but i'm drinking a little uh I, my, my son-in-law I, is in town so i got a little angel's envy today so i will tell you this uh I was trying to figure out how can I smoke a cigar and listen to and, and, and be on the show. So I headed over to, uh, to um, Caesars, to my friend Carlito Fuente's place, Casa de Fuente. Mm -hmm. And I, I had three mojitos before getting here. <laughs> I'm not a day drinker. I don't think I've had a drink in the middle of the day, but I'm with my buddies. They're drinking. We're smoking cigars. And I'm trying to figure out how could, there's music, you know, there, there's Cuban music in the background. And I'm like, no, I can't do this. Nobody's going to hear anything. And that's why I headed here. But I got, I got some in me right now. Trust me. Okay. Fair enough. Fair enough. So, but tonight we really want to be talking about Marvin, the filmmaker. And before we get into all of this, I just got to ask you, one simple ice-breaking question that's been resting on my mind since the last time I spoke to you. When I see people that get into the cigar business, you look at them and you go, you know you're getting yourself into a money pit. It's going to cost you a whole bunch of money. And I'm sure you went through that, and I know you guys did that with Drew Estate, you and, and Jonathan and the rest of the team. And your families were probably like going, you guys are all nuts. All right. Mm -hmm. um, but unlike the many, you're part of the few that hit pay dirt. You guys did a great job. So you went through that whole experience. And what do you do? You decide you're going to take some of that money. You're going to create a film. You're spending a whole bunch of your money. And your wife has got to be looking at you like going, haven't you had enough pain in your life? <laughs> yeah, she was. She thought I was out of my mind. She still thinks I'm out of my mind. <laughs> I mean, I, you know, I did, you know, I, I did do a little, you know, background on it. And I, I do know that the film, based on what I've read, cost about, what, five million to produce? Is that an accurate number from what I saw? It's more than that. Oh, yeah. More than that. Yeah, because you have you have some amazing talent in this movie. All right. Yeah. So I know that wasn't cheap to get good talent. No, but worth every penny. I, I wouldn't trade it for the world. So how, how would you compare just basically making this movie and investing so much into it to your experience 27 years ago? Wow. Um, similarities, differences, you know, I, I, in my cameo of my own film, I speak to 
Marvin played by Sean Astin and I'm speaking to my alter ego, so to speak, or I'm the alter ego. And I say something to the effect of cigars are a passion and you really can't think about it from a standpoint of making money. The minute you start thinking, and listen, every business is a business. I don't care, I don't care what business you, you know, you're in, but if you're going to do something with all of your heart, all of your soul, it better come from the heart and the soul and not from the pocketbook and the bean counters because it's just, it's A, it's never gonna work in my opinion, especially, you know, look, if you wanna, you know, become, uh, you know, an accountant, it's an admirable profession. But if you wanna become a cigar maker, or a filmmaker, it better start from here, like right in your heart, and right in your gut, or else don't do it at all. And that's the similarity that I see. And, and um, you see that in the film. I mean, I, I don't know you personally, um, but I know the story of your, of your, of your past company, um, I, I, I've lived that many of, uh, many of the cigar consumers have enjoyed many of the events and learning about the history, those that didn't know. But when I watched the film, I saw so much and you put so much heart and soul into the story. Not so much about you. I mean, this is a story that takes your father's front and center, played yeah. by Judd Hirsch. All right. Your mother, Carol Kane, okay, she plays her. And you can see how much you put into the, just the love affair that those two have had their whole lives and how much your father and your mother loved you growing up and supported you in your dreams going forward. Um, I want to play a clip here. <clears throat> and this is like the first clip of a few I'm going to play. Um, this clip, I want you to talk a little bit about it after I show it. All right, hold on. Um, People, Jimmy didn't prep me on this. I have no idea what he's about to show. Yeah, you're not going to, but you know the movie. So everything is in the movie. Yeah. All right. It's all, all right. in the movie. It's your movie. So you should know, you should know everything about it. All right, let's see. Let's see what you okay. chose. To okay. This is the first clip I'm going to show. And I almost died giving birth to you. You, you have a huge head. I All I wanted to do was come here, take him to the mall, and buy him a new phone. That's it. This is what I get. Okay, I go with you. Well, he's on a mission in there right now. I don't think he's going to really well, listen to you. We'll see about that. We're going to the mall for the destination. But he means in your Okay, go get ready. I, I don't know if that came through. On it, only the sound. The sound. Okay. I, I, I got to fix yeah. something here technically. And I, I don't think you, you, nobody saw the subtitles, so I don't think. I saw the subtitles. Subtitles were yeah. coming through on my phone. Okay. But basically, this is your, you, your father is jackhammering the bathroom because he's a plumber by trade. He's in there yeah. fixing the bathroom in the condo. There's smoke everywhere. And you need Stop. to go somewhere mm -hmm. and you want him to come. He don't want to go. But your mother yeah, let, let, goes in and yeah. says something in, in Yiddish and out he comes and says, I go with you. Yeah, she says, we're going to the mall or no hanky panky. <laughs> and he just walks and he just walks right out. Um, yeah, that actually happened. Uh, I showed up one day to my parents' house, apartment, sorry. And they're living in a retirement community. My parents are approaching 80 years old at this point. Okay. And when, I, when I'm on the outdoor landing, it's like a 200-foot landing that you're walking across to get to the end apartment. I start seeing smoke billowing out of the apartment. So I start running. And it turns out, like, my dad's jackhammering in the bathroom, creating a pile of dust that's coming out 
And the reason is, is that my mom can no longer go into the bathtub. So he was busting it out and, and putting in a stand-up shower. So I'm like, wait a minute, why aren't you calling a plumber? It's like, I am a plumber, but he's 80 years old and he's still jackhammering a bathtub. <laughs> so, so true story. So true story this, and I opened the film. And this movie follows, I, I, I imagine a lot of truth because from what I understand, you have told many a story. You've done some of this in kind of a stand-up comic routine with friends and stuff. Where I you mean, told I, stories of your family. I used to host approximately 120 in-store events throughout the country. I mean, throughout the world. And what I learned early on is, you know, most of the audience, you can only capture their attention speaking about your rapper filler binder and the brand for so long. Unless you're a diehard, within three minutes, they're not that interested. And that's the, the sad truth or the truth. So what I started doing was mixing in stories. And I had a lot of material to mine from, from stories about my dad. And they, they were hitting. And it got to a point where I was writing down like, you know, I would see the same stores every year. So I didn't want to repeat the same material. So I would write down which story I tell at each store. And I also didn't want to get bored telling the same story every time. So I go on a Tuesday to this store, a Wednesday to that store, Thursday, Friday, Saturday, Sunday, whatever. And each day I tell a different story and I would write in my phone what story I told so that next year I didn't repeat the same story. And I mean, there, you know, my friends know I've got not dozens, hundreds of stories about my dad to the point where when he watched the film for the first time, like the credits are rolling and I'm looking at him. I mean, I made this for him. And he turns to me, he goes, why you know, tell the story of the bloody hand. And I go, because... <laughs> I told other stories. I couldn't tell all the stories. It's not a three season series on Netflix. It's an hour and 40 minute movie. And he was pissed that I didn't tell other stories. <laughs> what are you going to do? What can you do? Now, how, how did you pull off getting a reunion of Judd Hirsch and Cal Kane? These two, the last time these two worked together was on the TV show Taxi. Yeah, I mean, mid early to mid '80s, they worked together. On, on how did you the, how did you pull that off? You're you're act, nobody in in the industry. The act, well, thank you, thank you, appreciate that, Jim. Well, back then, um, now you're gonna be big and famous, but I mean, I mean, um, yeah, they both actually won two Emmy awards each. Uh. uh Judd portrayed Alex Rieger in Taxi. Mm -hmm. He was the only one in the cast where his desires and dreams was just to be a taxi driver. Everyone else, you know, T Tony wanted to be a boxer and, uh, um, you know, Mary Lou Henner's character wanted to be a, a, a singer and everyone wanted to do something else, but he just wanted to drive a taxi. And, uh, Carol portrayed Simka mm -hmm. Grab, and she was Yaku's oh, yeah. wife, girlfriend, right. and, and then wife. And uh, she came on in, I believe, season two or three, and she just stole the show. And she she was on for the rest of the series, and she won, I believe, two Emmy awards for it. So, who did you reach out to first, Judd or Carol? I mean, I didn't reach out to either one of them. What happened was, and let, let, allow me to digress a bit, because I, I sure. think that it, 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 you know, the audience, you guys out there should get a sense of like, how did this happen? So I sell Drew Estate. My wife, Netta, gives birth to our twin daughters. And it should have been the culmination of a life's journey, so to speak, at the time I was 43. And, uh, my parent, my mother, two months two months after my kids were born, my mother, Fela Samuel, was diagnosed with Alzheimer's. 
and uh, to cope. I started simply writing down the stories that I would tell about my dad on stage. It was literally just a healing mechanism. And here I am, um, you know, two, four, six a.m. feedings for it, my infant children. And in the middle, I'm not going to go back to sleep. I'm just typing away. And I took a step back. I got like 40 pages written, just stories. There's no, there's no connective tissue to these stories and I'm like you know what there's something cinematic about these characters so I started I said you know what I'm going to write a screenplay how hard could it be <laughs> hey you so made the guys for, for yeah for, for how hard decades, could it be so Let, write a screenplay so I I bought copies of Goodwill Hunting, Terms of Endearment, and Almost Famous, three movies that I loved. And I said, all right, let's see how, you know, I like literally had like an FBI board. I made copies of all of the actors in each movie with lines to them on a, on a wall in my office. And I'm like, all right, so let's create my characters. You got Marvin, you got my dad, Mordecai, my mom, Fella, my wife, Netta, and you know, how hard could this be? I got stuck, man. This is hard. But one day I'm coming off of a plane and I call my dad and all I hear is static <laughs> with a few curse words in between. I'm like, dad, dad. I go, I can't hear a thing. That's it. I'm coming to get you and we're getting you an iPhone. And that becomes an interesting first thread of the movie. Yeah. So in the movie, as in real life, uh, and I'll give you the real life version because it's, it, you know, it, it leads into how I portrayed it in, in the film. So I take him to the Apple store in Aventura and he's yelling at me the whole way there. Like, I don't need an iPhone. Yeah, I just want flippy phone like I have. I mean, his flip phone was, it was 20 years old at this point and he just kept fixing it. It was in pieces and like, he would just like fix it. And like he had soldering materials to fix it. But you it. see, you're lucky. Your father had, at least had a cell phone. My father refused to ever get one and actually always had to use the phone that was wired to the wall that you dialed. So that <laughs> my, my, so what would cause that change I could not locate my parents when yes. the to towers went down. My parents were supposed to be at the trade center that day. Ooh. And I could, I didn't hear from them all day. And I didn't know if they were alive until that night. Mm -hmm. I was stuck in Jersey. I couldn't get back into the city. And I'm thinking that's it. They're gone. Mm. So when, when I finally heard from them, they went to the beach. Then they went to see my mother's brother and, and my brother, her my aunt and uncle, because they were able to see everything from uh, like Bay Bay Ridge by the Verrazano, where you can actually see, but you know you can see what was going on. So they got home late that night. Finally, I speak to them. I'm like, "That's it. You got to get a cell phone." And that's the same cell phone that he had almost 20 years later <laughs> so he kept fixing it and fixing it and now it finally broke on him i take him to the apple store and he gets handed the phone favad is this vetted the buttons he says so i realize i'm in trouble and apple had a program at the time where you can take lessons from the genius bar for a couple mm -hmm. of hundred bucks private lessons until you're ready to graduate to beginner for iPhone group lessons. I'm like, sign me up. So they said, you know, one, two, three lessons max and he'll graduate. And two months later, Mordecai's clocking six lessons a week. <laughs> yeah. All right. So this is the scene where he's sitting down with the young woman that is from the Apple store. And he, where he sits back and he looks at the phone for the first time going through it, 
and he's explaining there are no buttons. And she's then explaining, no, 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 let me show you. And he says something like, so they're buttons, but they're not buttons. <laughs> Correct. So, so he's clocking six lessons a week for two months. I'm like, what's going on over here? So I sneak up on him at the mall and it turns out he's become friends with a couple of these young men and women. And I sneak up, one minute he's telling them a story, they're laughing, you know, laughing their asses off. And another minute he's telling them a story about his life in which there was this one young girl and I saw a tear fall down her face. And that was my eureka moment. That's when I realized this is the vehicle for a script in which Mordecai starts taking lessons with this young girl at the Genius Bar. And she teaches him, you know, Siri, and who's actually a guest star in the film. Siri's in the film, uh, you know, with a cameo. And, uh, you know, Siri and Apple Music, etc. And he tells her the story of his life in flashback. And that's when I started writing, but I got stuck. And I realized I needed a ghostwriter. And after a long search, I found uh, Rudy Gaines, an award-winning filmmaker. And he, uh, he looked at my stories and he goes, yeah, I like this and agreed to write it with me. And uh, we had now a finished script. I started shopping the script around. And, uh, and finally I found my producer, Dahlia Heyman. And she brought on producer, uh, executive producer, Alan Bain. And uh, I had a team. So we were looking for a director now. And backtracking, when I only had like 40 pages of stories, a mutual friend without my permission sends my script, you know, my stories, to an, a friend of his who's an Academy Award winning director. And we all know who he is. He's made some of the most uh, amazing films of the last 35 years. And I'm like, what? how can you do this? How can you take my little stories and send it to this incredible director? He's like, you wanna stop your nannying and listen to what he had to say? And he's a Colonel and I retired Colonel. I'm like, yes, sir. He says, he told me to tell you to keep going. There's something there in these characters. And that gave me the courage to hire Rudy. And now, once I had my script ready, I was going to send it to this director. Maybe he wanted to direct the film. I get a call from Dolly and Allen, and they go, hey, great news. We found your director. I go, who? You get the fuck out of here. <laughs> never been on a film set before. You want me to direct? And what they said was, Marvin, this film is so much of your heart and soul that no one else but you can direct this film. If you give it to this filmmaker, he's a studio director. You're going to sell it to the studio, he's going to direct it. And you're going to lose complete control. And I go, wait a minute, I won't be in the editing room. And they just left. <laughs> so I thought about it. And I'm like, you know what? Unfortunately, at the time, they're right. And I just put everything into learning everything I could about being a director. I signed up for master class. And I studied Martin Scorsese, Spike Lee, Werner Herzog, Jodie Foster, Judd Apatow, Ron Howard, and others. And, you know, anything I could find on YouTube, anything I could find, like, you know, from anyone. I, I, you know, I sat next to Ray Allen, the, you know, Hall of Fame basketball player, and he played Jesus Shuttleworth in Spike Lee's He Got Game. And it was his first time ever on a film set himself. And he gave me some great advice. I just asked him, you know, what, what should I do? I'm going on in, in 30 days. He gave me some great advice at the time. Um, so now I'm directing the film and 
we had a casting director. Her name is A.V. Kaufman. And A.V. Kaufman has podiumed more Oscar winners than anyone. And she and I, she, we meet and she goes, who would you like to do, who would you like to play your father? And I said, you know what? I think Judd Hirsch would be perfect. So she said, all right, let's send it out to Judd. And meanwhile, let's pick 10 other potential Morde Mordecais just in case Judd Hirsch says no. I don't know, maybe a week or two later, I get a, the word that Judd Hirsch loved the script. He wants to meet me. Okay. So the meet set for Nick's Pizza, it's like 93rd and 2nd in, okay. in the upper in, Ma in Manhattan. In, in the city. That's what we call it there. The city. In, <laughs> in the, the city. city. In the city. So I show up an hour early. It's a Sunday afternoon. And I pay off the kid there to get the whole back room to myself. And over a pepperoni pie and a couple of bottles of wine, we're talking, this is and that's. And he knows I'm directing, but he's not make, making reference of it. Finally, so who's going to direct this thing? He called it this thing. I am, Judd. You? What have you directed? I've never been on a film set but I know these characters, I know their hearts and their souls, and I know that I can tell this story in a way that nobody else can, and with your help, we're gonna bring this to the world. And I put my hand out, and I go, so, what do you say? And he's looking at me, he's looking at my hand, I'm looking at him, nothing's happening. Oh, wow, cold ice. And finally, he goes, let me think about it. Judd. This, this is a one-time offer, Judd. And he looks at me like, <laughs> I thought he was gonna punch me, but I wasn't saying this to be an answer. <laughs> Judd, my mother's dying. And it's been four years since I read her the script and I made her a promise that I was gonna make this into a film while she was alive. So with all due respect, you're my first choice, but you ain't my only choice. So respectfully, are you in or are you out? And he looked at me for what felt like an eternity. And finally, he shook my hand, we sit back down. So who do you have for, to play your mother, fella? I go, well, I knew you weren't, I wasn't gonna let you take no for an answer. So I wanted to wait and get your thoughts. What do you think of Carol Kane? And his face just started being, he goes, I love it. <laughs> and so in Hollywood, you know, my people are supposed to call her people. She didn't know any of this. Months later, I find out that before he hit the door of the pizza shop, Carol, I just agreed to play the lead role in a movie and you're gonna play my wife. We had a movie to make. Uh, that's, that's how it happened. Wow. All right, let yeah. me take a uh, let me take another quick commercial break. It's about four minutes. So get yourself a drink if you need another one. If you're still inebriated, it's okay. And when we come <laughs> when we come back, um, we're gonna dig more into this. I'm gonna use some standard clips that are on online. So that should play fine. Um, All right. Obviously, it's not letting me do what I wanted to do, which would have been much better. But cool. Or you could lose. play the the audience the trailer. I don't know. That's Maybe. what I was going to do. I was going to go through pieces of the trailer and 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 talk about Perfect. Barton. Okay. Okay. So there's some really good stuff in there too. So let me just uh, awesome. tee this tee this one here up. This show is brought to you by Casa Cuevas cigars. In the 19th century. Juan Cuevas, Spanish immigrant from Santanda, began what was to be a family business which now spans four generations. Like others, fortunate enough to live and work in Pinar del Rio province of Cuba, Juan commenced cultivating tobacco, turning it into a successful business. Following in his father's footsteps, 
His son, Juan Jr., continued with the family business, successfully expanding it until events which took place in 1959 forced a dramatic change. Years later, in the Ciabo Valley of the Dominican Republic, Luis Cuevas Sr., Juan Jr.'s son, carried on the family tradition of handcrafting fine cigars in the family's cigar factory, Tabacalera Las Lavas. Today, Lewis Sr. is joined by his son, Lewis Jr., in the manufacturing and sale of premium long filler cigars at their factory, Tabacalera Las Lavas, in Santiago, Dominican Republic. So check out Casa Cuevas Cigars at www.casacuevascigars.com and on their Instagram and Facebook channels. Introducing Blackened Cigars, M81 by Drew Estate. A dark, bold, and unapologetic cigar collaboration. My job is all about taste. So when James mentioned he wanted to create an exclusive cigar, I was stoked. Like Metallica, Drew Estate has some of the most hardcore fans out there. I've known Rob Dietrich for years. And when he approached me to collaborate on this, we couldn't be more excited. I mean Metallica, Black and Whiskey, and Drew Estate, what could be a better passion project? Needed to craft a cigar unlike anything in our portfolio. One that would take cigar fans on the deepest, darkest, heaviest journey into the mystical world of Maduro. Full-bodied with notes of espresso, leather, and dark chocolate. Blackened Cigars, M81 by Drew Estate. Before you light your next cigar, be sure to check out Cigar Medics, the makers of the patent-approved Humidimeter. The humidimeter is a tool designed to display the relative humidity inside your cigar. With this device, there's no more guessing. Simply insert the probes into the foot or cap of your cigar, and you can instantly know if your cigar is ready to be smoked. Buy now on CigarMedics.com and see site for other cigar accessories. With the humidimeter, you'll know when to hold them and know when to smoke them. And today's show is brought to you by Bocock Brothers Cigars, a new and active brand founded by two Honduran brothers, Bryant and Douglas Bocock. The brand zeroes in on those folks that are looking for easy-to-smoke cigars inspired by unusual circumstances. Very importantly named after their very interesting and imitable last name, Bocock. Right now, Bocock Brothers is featuring their signature edition, made at the A.J. Fernandez factory in Esteli, Nicaragua. It features an Ecuadorian Sumatra wrapper, a Nicaraguan Habano binder, and a Nicaraguan filler. Available in three popular formats, a Robusto, a Toro, and a Gordo. You can check out Bocock Brothers Cigars at www.bocockbrothers.com. And today's show is brought to you by Platinum Nova Cigars. Platinum Nova is a family-owned and operated premium cigar company. Only the highest vintage tobacco and the most skilled hand workmanship go into the making of each Platinum Nova cigar. This results in a timeless blend of art and craftsmanship. The Nova brand and the family's work are a tribute and an honor to their grandfather to always remember him and his infinite passion for the finest cigars. Their love for cigars started with their grandfather, a dedicated master blender and entrepreneur in the cigar industry. So the next time you're looking for that exquisite cigar experience, pick up a Platinum Nova. You can check them out at Platinum Nova Cigars, www.novacigar.com, and on their Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter channels. All right, let's come back to Marvin. So, um, one of the clips in the, uh, in the trailer, um, and what I really wanted to show was the end of this scene, but uh, I'll explain it, and you can explain it too. Um, in this scene, uh, your father is uh, hanging out with um, the iPhone teacher at her apartment, and she needs to help paint the house. And he goes over and he decides to help her paint the wall, but he's going to paint the mural because your father is also a painter 
as we'll get into later. And he starts to do the painting. And that's the end of that clip. So unfortunately, he, he starts painting that orange on there. And as you're going through it, as that continues in that scene, what ends up happening is this magnificent mural for all you Drew Estate fans with the bridge and the New York scene and everything. Did that really happen? Um, yeah, so that scene, I'll repeat quickly, um, that never happened uh, in real life. You know, uh, it, it still is a film. It's based on a true story, but I needed to take you somewhere you know, where you're on this journey that's not a documentary, so to speak. It's based on my father's life and the facts of what happened in his past. Um, but in that scene, uh, the character of Nina and Mordecai, this scene shows how they're both actually forming this true friendship together. And in the end, Mordecai accidentally sees something in her apartment, which makes him start to question her her background, like why does she have this item in her apartment? And I don't want to give any spoilers away, but uh, it leads Mordecai down a path and Nina down a path that culminates later on in the film. And one of the things, again, yeah, one of the other things about this movie, which I find besides the heartwarming experience of your mother and your father and how she the, the love affair that they had the dementia that starts to set in um there's a scene that I, I i i don't have the show here but where she's walking out of the condo where your father's at a party and um she walks into the street and she gets hit by a car mm -hmm. um is that a real moment yeah. and and i'm if i'm bringing that up and it's hitting a uh, something in your soul, you know, just, I apologize for that. Well, I, you know, no need to apologize. I, you know, I bore my soul to the world in my film. Um, so yeah, that scene is based in fact, she was never hit by a car, but she ended up wandering on Biscayne Boulevard in a nightgown in the middle of the street one night. Um, there were a lot of things. This was like while I was selling Drew Estate, my wife Nett is pregnant, and uh, a very close friend of mine, Eric Espinosa, uh, he has a sit down with me and his wife, his wife Susie was very close with my mom. And she, she worked in a, like one of these uh, high end boutiques there. And they would get lunch together, et cetera. And Susie started seeing that my mom was getting lost in the mall. And I was so wrapped up between my wife's pregnancy with twins, the sale of the company. I would see my dad, you know, my parents on weekends and I'd say, dad, something's wrong with mom. And he's like, ah, what are you talking about? She's brick made from stone. Enough, stop with this. And finally, you know, it took the dust to settle in my life for me to say, all right, I need to take my mom to a neurologist. And that was the, and that's what ended up being the diagnosis was Alzheimer's. Um, but that scene, although she was never hit by a car, she was in the middle of the street in a nightgown. Wow. Yeah, that man. had to be, that had to be frightening. I didn't learn about it until months later. He, my dad held, kept a lot from me. Now, was he was he at that party at the time? No, no. So that, you know, that I, I that was a fabrication, so to speak. Mm -hmm. That was, you know, me taking poetic license. In sure. fact, you know, th those characters in the film were composites of the young men and women my, who taught my father how to use the iPhone. They're not real life characters. OK. So the movie moves along. One of the other threads that is in this movie I found compelling is the whole uh, the whole thread uh, around the Holocaust. Your father was a Holocaust survivor. He didn't. He wasn't in a camp. Correct. Okay. He was never in the camps. They escaped from the town, the village of Jano Podlovsky, Poland. At the start of the war, it was on the Soviet Polish border. 
And when Stalin invaded in September of 1939, they passed, they passed my, uh, my family's home two minutes after the orders were given. Wow. And, and my, as depicted in the, in the film, I'm not gonna give it away, something happened that made my grandfather decide to leave. And they fled into the Soviet Union. They were picked up there and sent to Siberia. And that was where my, my grandmother perished. And it's also depicted in the film. Yeah, yeah. And, and so yeah, was... the, look, um, I didn't want to make a Holocaust film, but no. I could, but I but couldn't you make touch, it. But you touched on it because it's history. It's your family. It's, it's your father. But it, but, you know, I, I found that the universe was lacking in film that showed how these people who suffered so much, how they lived their lives. And I wanted to, it to be a triumphant story of how this one man who went through so much came out the other end and still his soul was intact. He still, like the ethos of the film even though it's about some very serious topics is comedy because that's my dad. And that's how I wanted to portray the, the, the story of the film. I could have easily went to a dark place, but just like my dad doesn't go to that dark place other than moments, that's the film as well. It is, it's a real roller coaster ride. You're going to laugh, you're going to cry, um, but I know you'll be engaged. And, uh, you know, it's, it's, I, been a, it's been a crazy journey, Jimmy. It's been eight years since I put pen to paper. And now, you know, we had an 80 plus theater theatrical run in the spring. Uh, we were everywhere. We were in, you know, New York, Florida, DC, Phoenix, Washington State. I mean, over 80 theaters. And now uh, we're on, on demand. You can, you know, you can rent it or buy it on Amazon, Apple, your cable box. You know, if you're old school, you can buy a DVD any way you want and uh, give it a check out. Uh, it is my diary of what was going on as I was selling Drew Estate. So you do get into the heart and the soul of the cigar maker. And right. it's a very, you know, we're a very small fraternity. You know, there's not that many cigar makers in the world today. And I bear it all. I show you the struggles of a cigar maker. And, you know, the, the, just so that people understand, I channeled an earlier period of the journey of, you know, being a cigar maker. So this is not, you know, you know Marvin, the owner of one of the largest cigar companies in the world. It's Marvin struggling to make ends meet Marvin with this dream of this, you know, uh, you know, with, and, and a blend that he believes the world is about to, you know, embrace, but he's not, you know, he's struggling. Yeah. So, you have that one scene where you're sitting outside at the table with your wife and you've got the bundle of cigars in front of you. I love this scene where you pick up the cigar, you examine it, you smell it, you light it, your wife looks at you and she says, so what do you think? And you kind of look at it and you just realize it's just not ready yet. And it's time and patience in this business that gets the quality cigars on the shelf. You could put a cigar on a shelf, but to have a quality cigar takes a lot of time and patience to get it right. Um, and you showed that and, and you got money tied up in all of this while you're waiting for it to be right. You know? Yeah. I mean, look, I tried to give the audience a, a taste of the challenges of the cigar maker, but I had to take some poetic license in terms of how cigars are cured. They're not exactly cured the way I describe them in the film for all you like you know, leaf heads who are going to now complain and say, I've gotten some like, hey, you said a few things about cigars and that, you know, how they're, how they're cured and they're not true. I'm like, are you kidding me? 
Like, <laughs> of course I, but, but I needed to, you know, I needed to communicate with a broader audience of, you know, people who may not understand what those challenges and what the crazy journey of the cigar maker is like. And I, I, I feel I captured it, at, you know, and uh, I think it's a, it's a film that if you are a lover of the leaf, you're going to love, you're going to really enjoy how the journey of the cigar maker, you know, we all live lives. We're not just cigar makers. We have families. We have you know, children, we have lives that we're living. And I focused on that and not the journey, but you're seeing it while it's happening. It's, right. you know, life is being lived while other things are happening. And I try to, that's, that's the overall sense of the film. You're a voyeur on a journey of, let's call it six to eight weeks with the Samuel family. There's no beginning, there's no end. So when the film ends, and Mordecai and Fellow are walking away, you realize they're gonna wake up the next day. And right. it, you know, for me, it's really meta because, you know, on Saturdays, my dad comes over and all the characters in the film, uh, except for my mom, she passed away two months before we filmed. Wow. Um, yeah, so, but, but she's there, her, her embodiment, is there for the ages on in on cell you know on celluloid and, and i could and I, and I told you this when i talked to you the other week and i'll tell everybody too my, my wife is a huge film buff i mean she goes all the way back to the black and white she knows characters she knows characters families she knows you know aunts uncles sons and daughters and granddaughters that are in the film industry and who they related to i mean she knows it all so when I told her about this, you know, and I said, we got to watch this film together. I'm going to tell you, this is going to be a good film. And, and she's, a, and I'm, a, you know, explaining to her what it's about and, you know, and about you. And, and she kind of like gives me that smirk, like, so the cigar guy did a film. I mean, come on, how good can it be? We sat down and we watched it. And like you said, we were engaged in the film. She was engaged in the film. And at the end, when it was all over, I looked at her and I said, so what do you think? And she goes, it was extremely well-written. It was an engaging film. It was heartwarming. It made her cry at certain points, made me shed a tear at certain points. I laughed at certain points. Um, it's a phenomenal film. I, somebody had asked, we're talking all about, I Mordecai is the name of the film. Mordecai is... Marvin's father. So it's remember this film has a lot to do about Mordecai, but it brings in the whole family, as Marvin says, and how it all plays together in a number of days in the life of the family. And it was a it's a great film. And you oh, know, I, I, I look at critics, you know, and I have to laugh because. I always laugh at critics, right? Because every time a critic says something's not good, I go watch it. <laughs> well, you no, know, it's not. Look, um, I, I, I got some excellent reviews and some not. Um, I can, you can debate some of the points they made up, but what is not debatable is some of the critics actually said that the film was not believable because of an over-the-top accent that Judd played. Yeah, he and did have a little, he was a little, my wife did say he did a little over-the-top on that. But, but no, that's That was thing. your father. That's my dad. He right. played, and you know, he actually- Judd He met actually, your dad. He met your dad probably. My dad was on set every day. Yeah, so he so, understood your father. You know, for all of you in the audience, when you watch the film, watch through the end of the end credits and you'll see my real dad teaching Judd how to speak. Mm -hmm. And, and, and you hear my dad speaking and it's an accent that truthfully is a dying accent. The pre-World War II, you know, Eastern European Jewish accent. And it's been watered down for, for entertainment over the years. And I wasn't going to allow that. I wasn't going to water it down 
And for that, some of the critics ripped me a new asshole. And to <laughs> that point, I say, fuck you. This yeah. is my dad. Just to that point, meaning I'm not above getting criticized. You know, there are plot points that you want to talk about. Sure. But I'm not going to accept you telling me that it's over the top accents because that's who my father is. That's the generation that he represents. Right. And you captured it. And, and if you what you just said, you captured it beautifully and you ought to get credit for that. Well, thank you, man. Appreciate you know, that. Because you, you really made that happen. And you had an actor that really was able to work with your father and take and, that right to screen. And to judge credit, he actually resisted a little bit and we got into it at first. And I thought he was doing it for other reasons. And what I learned is he was concerned that by going so real on the accent that, you know, middle America doesn't know that that inflection. They don't know that sound and they may not understand. You know, it's not that you can't understand what he's saying, but it's a foreigner speaking. And in most films today, when you have a foreigner speaking, it's usually with an English, American English person or accent that's just inflected a little bit to give you the sense. I didn't want to go there. I wanted it to be real. No, you hit the nail on the head then. Oh, thank you. Now, thank one, you. another question on the, on the casting. Um, so Sean Astin plays you in the film. Correct. How did you come upon Sean to play that? Because I loved Sean Astin. I loved him in the Goonies. I loved him in um, the uh, the dark, the witch McCall movies. Rudy? Um, the, well, it was in Rudy. Rudy, all, Lord and of the, the Lord Rudy. of the Ring. The Lord of the Rings. Yeah, yeah he's so, Samwise Ganji, man. <laughs> no, so on. you brought in, an, uh, uh, and, and he's such a happy individual, okay? whenever he plays things, um, you brought he, him he in. Is, you know, people ask me, is he for real? And the answer is, yeah. I mean, he was so genuine. And look, uh, he's not only been an actor his whole life, his parents are uh, um, Patty Duke. Mm -hmm. And- uh, That's what my wife uh, said. <laughs> yeah. And his father played- uh, uh, um, the uh, Gomez, um, uh, Gomez from the Adams family, yeah, he yeah. played him on the Adams family, so he's Hollywood royalty and he's been acting since and he Carol was Kane was in the Adams family, too. The remake, yeah, yeah, the not, remake. The original. not the original, so, so, um, he's an Academy Award nominated filmmaker he he was nominated for academy award for best short as a director and he's directed other things so he was very helpful with me very giving um I, you know it's not like i directed him we truly collaborated together because think about it he's playing me and i'm directing him playing me that doesn't happen too often and no. uh, how he got a lot of how he portrayed me is from copying my like he and he said it you know he said it in print and in interviews he kind of like looked at my mannerisms I speak with my hands and my whole body and soul it's just from where I'm from and uh and yeah he, he really captured the essence of me and you know how exhausted I was during that time period of my life between my company my babies and my and my mom and my dad. Wow. So let's let, let's roll the clock back a little and go back. I want to go back to uh, a young Marvin Samuel. So how, how young? They, well, well, let, 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 let me let me frame it for you. When after watching a movie and understanding your mother and your father from the movie being as accurate portrayal as it is, your father's a plumber. Okay. You went to law school, okay? Nope. Where'd you? You didn't go me. to law school. No, I thought was, you. I thought you were. I thought you were a fraternity brother of. Uh... I was. I. I was a undergrad. Okay. Uh, at Oneonta State. Oh, at Oneonta, you guys yeah. together. We, you, you were fraternity brothers. Yep. You yep. Honest. In undergrad. Okay, so, 
Um, I know when I went to college, there was my father was a printer. There was no money in the family for college. I had to do everything I could to put myself through four years of school. Okay. Beg and borrow and do whatever I had to do. Um, I would imagine you had a similar path. Uh, yes and no. Um, so I started working when I was and you know, I kind of took poetic license again in the film. Uh, I started working. My dad dragged me from the schoolyard. I was playing stickball. I'm literally batting and he literally drags me by the ear to the local bodega called the Nasher on Flatlands Avenue in Brooklyn, deposits me there and says, you now work. And I was clocking 40 hours a week in junior high school and high school. Yeah, that's what I was doing. Um, so I had some savings. My parents did help me out. And truthfully, I knew I was going to work the rest of my life. I already had a job lined up when I graduated college. Something told me this is going to be your one time to go out and party. So I did do that. My fraternity brothers will say I did do a lot of that because I knew what was ahead of me. I was in the working world. I, you know, I, I, I worked for my cousin as a mortgage broker while I was in college and, you know, during the summers and breaks. And uh, I knew what I had ahead of me. I had a job lined up and I said, these are, the, are going to be the best years of your life. And uh, yeah, they were the best four and a half years of my life, you know, in terms of my youth. Oh, yeah, I have to agree. I had the same same experience. I was yeah. just like, that was it. And then I had to go get a real job and been doing exactly. it now. And I've got another year and a half to go. And I'm probably going to hit the retirement train and just enjoy reaps of my my work after. God, I've been working since I was 11 years old. doing whatever Don't I completely do. retire, Jimmy. Do something to, I'm telling oh, you. Like, I, look what I, I do. Look what I do. This is going yeah. to continue. My Good. site continues. Good. And, and I've now been moving into, um, I've been raising money right now for autism through a uh, campaign oh. where I call it uh, the climb for autism. So my son and I were going over to Japan in another month and we're climbing Mount Fuji. Um, oh, wow. I, I promised him that when he got his doctorate, which he did, he got his doctorate in neurobiological research at Vanderbilt, studying the autism spectrum. And um, I told him when he got that, we're going to go to Japan and climb Mount Fuji. Um, That's there's a whole storyline behind it. So he's created a charity for it on Autism Speaks. And we've raised over 5,000 and we're expecting to raise a little more before the before it. And by doing this, I've, I've become how very can, how passionate. Can listen, hold on. How can your listeners... Uh, uh, they yeah. know. So let me show. Everybody knows. So we'll do it one more time because I've been talking about this on every show. Let Beautiful. me just pop let me just pop this up here and go to here. And so basically you're gonna end up going to stogiepress.com. And if you go to stogiepress.com and I'll share this in just a second here. We should be. So when you go to stogiepress.com, you click this link right at the top called Cl the Climb for Autism. That Climb for Autism, oh, uh, wow. story, this is my son, and this is a little excerpt out of his, uh, his, his, his doctoral thesis. Um, you can come down here and scan that barcode, um, or you can click this link, and either one of those will take you to this charity right here. I don't touch any of this money. Nothing, nothing even touches my hands. We've Stop raised, that. we've raised over five thousand right now. We are the number two fundraiser right now on this site, and I want to get to be number one. I need five hundred dollars more to get to be number one, and um, that's our goal. We're trying to be the best, but I'm going to tell you when you do something like this, and it's been a journey for the last three months since I announced this. Um, you really begin to feel it. You know, I walk nine miles every Sunday. I walk up and down the sides. I was going to say, you better be up walking up real hills. I have a causeway here that has like a 40 foot climb on rock. 
from the Forty river. Foot. Up. How yeah. tall is Mount Fuji? Oh, it's 13,000, but it's, it's an incline. I'm doing incline training, right? So you got to walk, okay. walk up yeah. and I do this like 10 times. Okay, good. All right. That's Keep, the you know, to get the glutes going and the knees and walking down and walking awesome. up, right? When Just guys, to get that level. When are you guys leaving? So we leave on the, uh, the 8th of July. We get there on the 9th. We climb on the 13th and the 14th. So two, Beautiful. It's two days. So we're doing this, but, but the thing is I get, it's, it's, it's become something inside of me. And I've realized that as I get older, I just want to give back. I have so many people I know and things I can do that it's time to just get out there and volunteer and do things. That's what you do in retirement. Yeah. You get out and you just, you just put your heart and soul into other things. You take all your talents that you have and all your connections and you try to help people. Okay, because maybe you couldn't do it because you're raising families and you're putting kids through college and you're paying bills and you're doing all this stuff. Yeah, all of a sudden, it, it, you stuff. reach a certain point in your life, you're like, let me give back. That's that's amazing. Nope. That's and, uh, and that, that's all you want to do. Really inspiring, bro. Yeah. So let me ask you a, a question, a, a cigar related question. So now now that you have moved away from Jewish State and you're still a cigar enthusiast and fashion yep. model, probably. Um, what is, uh, what's jazzing you lately? What, what, what do you see out there that you really enjoy? Well, I'm sure the audience would love to hear from you on, you know, what you're smoking yeah. these days. Um, what is truly rewarding to me is that so many of the people who came up through the Drew Estate universe now have their own companies and to me, you know, the fact that so many Drew Estate alumni have started their own cigar companies and now had the autonomy to fully express their passions from, you know, my former president, Steve Saka, and his journey. And now his right hand person is one, like I mentioned him earlier, one of my best friends, Dave Lafferty. Yep. Uh, to um nick malillo yep i nick i was just gonna say nick nicholas malillo who uh you know he ran our factory um and he has a company of his own uh eric espinosa who worked for drew estate for uh, 15 years and he started out on his own and you know he was a no and he'll he'll yell at me when i say this but he was and is no spring chicken <laughs> and to get this business, you know, where he started about 10 or 12 years ago, he didn't have to do that, but his passion drove. Mm -hmm. And it's really uh, remarkable to see. And the blends that are coming out of his factory, you know, La Zona are incredible. Uh, oh, the knuckle sandwich is off the chart. Oh, off great. Off great, the shot. great. Yeah. And it's really... Uh, great that he's working with Guy Fieri and uh, yeah, very, very proud of them. And uh, it's great to see, um, you know, on my end currently, you know, my wife and I are raising eight year olds and I am very keenly aware you got one shot and my twin girls, Talia and Ariella, they're my everything. Mm -hmm. And for me to think about, you know, I know myself, if I was going to start a cigar company today, I don't know how to half-ass anything. Right. So here I am. I'm going to literally try and make it first class. I'm going to be on the road 200, 250 days a year. And what's going to happen when I have, when there's a dance recital or a graduation and I got to be up in DC for events, or I got to be in New York, LA, Dallas. I, I, you know what? I did that. I'm not, you know, and I, and, and that's what's so hard because I have so many friends and, you know, acquaintances that individually and in their totality so enriched my life with their touch, with that connection. So I'm not sure yet how to turn that into something. And Thank you know. Luckily, I'm in no rush. You know, I'm. 
you know, I'm blending right now. I got a little something, something that I'm working on, but I'm, am I going to sit there and now, you know, release a cigar line and do it the way that, you know, is traditional? I don't think so. But have you heard the last of me? I don't know. Uh, well, we'll see. We're going to be, we're going to be keeping an eye out for your journey and may, maybe there's more films in the work. Who knows? Could be. And that's why, that's why right now I'm just blessed that I have an incredible family. I have friends. I have purpose in life. And uh, it's been a great ride, man. You are the success story of the cigar industry. There's no doubt about it. There are so many, many young companies stories. out there that are successful in their own way. You know, cigar new cigar company hits the market. I would say after about four or five years, if they're still on the market and they got about 400 shops that they're in and they're getting reorders, they are successful because they're moving, yeah. they're moving product. But to have taken it to the level that that you and Jonathan did is what people's dreams are. They 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 idolize you and they say, "I want to be that." And you know, how do I get there? And you said it: never stop. You have to be constantly on top of eighteen it. hours a day, days a week. There was no even on vacation. You're not truly on vacation. You're you're right. you're, you're you're in your mind. You're thinking, "Holy cow, I have." 2,500 mouths to feed. Mm -hmm. Okay. Think about them, their families, how much responsibility that is. I have thousands of stores who depend upon their product being consistent, their product arriving on time, their product, you know, to as, as much as possible. Of course, there's shortages all the time in this crazy business. Um, but it was a responsibility that I never took lightly. Um, and I can take away that over the course of, you know, close to 20 years in the cigar business, you know, we made many people happy and gave them a little bit of joy while they're smoking. So. Absolutely. Well, we appreciate everything you've done. I really appreciated the movie. Get out Thank there. You. I, Mordecai, you can find it on Netflix. You can find it on. No, no, not Netflix. No, not no, on Amazon. Amazon. Definitely. I've, Apple, you can find it. Um, I got it on Amazon. It was like $2.46. I think I rented it for two days. Rented it again for the show today. Um, I should have just bought it for $9. Should have bought it. <laughs> but, you know, well, I, I don't you score can also, stuff. You can also go to imordecai.com. M O R I M O R D E C A I dot com. And you can see, you know, articles about us and clips, et cetera. And it can take you right, it takes you right to, uh, you know, one click away from being able to watch my film. There you go. So everybody get out there and check it out. Um, Amazing. Well, it was, it was great being able to have this conversation with you, Jimmy. And uh, if you guys get a chance, Watch my film, I, Mordecai, and, uh, you know, you can hit me up afterwards. Uh, join my Instagram, Marvin Samuel on Instagram, and you can hit me up. Tell me what your thoughts are. I'll always write back. And, uh, yeah, it's been great. Thank right. you. Thank you. Enjoy Vegas. Uh, don't do anything crazy out there. You know, it's nah. <laughs> <laughs> going to dinner with some friends. There you go. Why not? And have a few drinks. Much appreciated. Thank you for coming on. Let's go Yankees. Goodbye. Okay. We'll see. Thanks, all. You all have a great day. And that's our show for today. <laughs>